Hi everyone, welcome back to Asian Art. In this lecture, we're going to return to a very important uh, theme in our discussion of Hindu art, and that is the idea of performance, dance performance, theater performance, expressive qualities in the art that we've seen already, and how these ideas sort of came to fruition in India. To begin with, let's talk about this ancient theater form in India called Sanskrit drama, which began way back in the 4th century BCE and survived all the way to about the 10th century CE. So that's really uh, 1,500 years of theater traditions. It's an incredible long history. But essentially, Sanskrit drama dies out, and we have no real knowledge of what it actually looks like, except for the fact that it was written down in exhaustive detail in this book called the Natya Sastra, which was composed about 200 BCE to about 200 CE. So sometime in this 400-year period, people were compiling and describing what became known as this Sanskrit drama. So even though there is no surviving examples of Sanskrit drama, there is one of the oldest theater forms in India called Kutiyatam, and it is a kind of remnant of that original Sanskrit drama. It has survived for a time when it was still directly influenced, when Sanskrit drama still existed in India. But it has gone through many, many changes. And so it only distantly resembles what must have been the Natya Sastra theater that we see described. So what is Sanskrit drama is really hard to say. But there are a few very important telling details which proved to be very influential. For even though Sanskrit drama dies out, the Natya Sastra preserved enough of an idea about what it was about and what its artistic goals were that it continued to have a lasting influence in traditional theater all the way down to the present day. To begin with, Sanskrit drama is really focused on the actor. The actor is, in a sense, performing before the audience, and they sort of are able to command the show and can improvise within a certain structure. So it provides, you know, lots of freedom for the performer to expand or contract their performance, depending on how the performer feels the audience's interest is growing or waning. And so this is a very important part of Sanskrit drama, that everything else is kind of looking to the actor and watching for clues from the actor about what to do. Take, for example, music, which is sort of undergirds the entire performance. In a Sanskrit drama performance, musicians follow the cues of the actor and make sure that the actor's actions are accentuated and brought to life in this kind of vibrant and intense manner. And so music is there to kind of enliven the performance and draw out these important themes and ideas and feelings. But it's the performer who really is conducting and, and directing the musicians in what to perform. Another very interesting aspect of Sanskrit drama is the role of the comic performer, known in times past as the Vidusaka. The Vidusaka is a clown character who has, of course, like all clown characters, an opportunity to make fun of what's going on in the action, but they do it in a very interesting way. What we know about the language of Sanskrit is that only certain 
elites really understood the language. So Brahmins and perhaps Kshatriya, kings and warriors, they would have been familiar with the Sanskrit language, which was a language dedicated to the gods. Everyone else spoke a very common language called Prakrit, if you will recall. Now, the Vidusika was a character who, in a sense, kind of translated what was happening. So the heroic characters, the lead performers, they would speak all in Sanskrit. But it was the Vidusika who would then reply to what they were doing or sum up what they were saying in a comic way using the local dialect. This allowed people who were not of the higher castes to enjoy the theater as well. We know from the Sanskrit drama, it was very important that everyone in the audience find some pleasure in the performance. So, one of the key ideas in Sanskrit drama, one of the basic goals of a performance, is to evoke in the audience a feeling, an emotion that comes from the performance. And this was called rasa. Rasa is not what the actors did. Rasa is what the audience felt. Bhava is what the actors did. Here is an actor performing nine different bhavas. Typically, the Natyasastra identifies eight essential bhavas as the center of all important rasa. The rasa are these feelings. Now, if you look at the actor's face, perhaps you can recognize them. Some of the most common ones would be uh, anger, disgust, mirth, heroism, sadness. These are all kind of basic human emotions. And it's uh, interesting the way the Sanskrit theater kind of ties into these very fundamental human experiences in communicating these messages about the gods and about these heroic epics. So actors trained to communicate this idea of rasa through their bhavas. Because in the Sanskrit theater, rasa was something that belonged in the audience because they really felt that the word was about something the audience member brought to the performance and evoked out of the performance. Because in reality, they say, like, if you eat or drink something, the tasting of a food is not in the food, it is in the taster. Because the experience of the taster can get more, an experienced taster can get more out of certain tastes and flavors than someone who's trying it for the first time. And so this idea of rasa was really something about the experience of the person doing the tasting. And that's the word rasa. It means feeling, but it also means sort of flavor and essence, the essence of a thing that really is something coming out of the taster. So that if you are a person who enjoys a really good bottle of beer or wine, or soda, you have a way of enjoying those special flavors to a degree that someone who has never tasted it before might have. And so this idea, there are these rasikas, the people who are experts in tasting or experiencing the emotions of the performance. The idea of rasa and bhava goes into every aspect of every art. And there's an attempt to communicate the mood or feeling of an art object through these basic emotions. We see here a picture of Ganesh, and he is gold, and therefore he is wondrous, and he is such a spectacle, and he is uh, amazing to behold. And so the color of this painting is meant to enhance or enrich our feelings toward the deity. And so they have these sort of connections to these different feelings and emotions to these different colors. 
So this became sort of codified in the 5th and 7th centuries CE and sort of carried on uh, throughout the centuries down to the present day. Now, Katakali is a performance that began some 500 years after the end of Sanskrit drama, sometime in the 16th century. They sat down with a copy of the Natya Sastra, this guidebook to Sanskrit drama, and they tried to come up with a theater that they wanted to watch using the principles they found there. They mixed it up, they changed it, they enhanced it in different ways. And today, Katakali is considered one of the most popular traditional forms of theater in India today. Katakali is not Sanskrit drama directly, but it's based on Sanskrit drama. It's based on the Natya Sastra's understanding of the Sanskrit drama. One way in which it's different from Sanskrit drama is that Katakali is typically done as an all-male performance, and we have from evidence that that was not the case in Sanskrit theater. Katakali actors train at a very young age to perfect this very complicated system of communicating through hand signs, through mudra. And so we've seen mudra on statues and Hindu and Buddhist statues both use these hand signs as a way of communicating. There are about 67 basic hand signs that are recombined and put together to create all kinds of different meanings and ideas in the performance. So the mudra are the sort of essential communication. Mudra first began as a way of evoking prayer. So that if you were a Brahmin priest and you were saying a prayer to a deity, you not only said the prayer, but you also performed accompanying mudras, hand signs. Now, it may have been that these hand signs were initially done as a way to help the Brahmin priest remember these complicated prayers. But over time, they themselves become this very important performative quality. And so they come into the art and they come into the theater. So mudra exists in ritual, in art, and in theater. Another very interesting contemporary tradition based on the Natya Sastra was the traditional dance Paratnatyam. Now, there have been, for centuries and centuries, uncounted temple dancers, women who were uh, wedded to the temple, they lived at the temple, and it was their job to train and dance for special temple occasions, and their dances were offerings to the gods. These temple dancers uh, had a very long-lasting tradition that is described in the Natchez Sastra through various techniques and mudras that they used. As India entered into the 19th and late 19th and 20th century, temple dancing came under attack because it was associated with prostitution. And so temple dancers were, in a sense, kind of uh, banned from living in the temples. And so the temple dance was on the verge of extinction when a number of women stepped forward and tried to reform the Bharatanatyam dance to create a theater dance tradition that people could perform today. And thus it was artists like Balasaraswati in 1934 who really popularized this. One thing that's, of course, obviously different about Bharatanatyam and temple dancers is the costume is much more conservative and the dance is sort of based on the, what they could find examples of in statues, on temples, and from descriptions of performances in the Natya Sastra. So it's very easy when you see a Bharatanatyam dance, you can see how it relates directly back to the artistic tradition. Notice this Bharatanatyam dancer on the left and how she resembles Shiva's dance 
uh, on the right. Now it's time for our review quiz. Question one, what is the Natya Sastra and what kinds of information does it have? Question two, what is the relationship between Katakali and the Natya Sastra? Question three, what is the relation between bhavas and rasas? Question four, what is the origin of mudra? Question five, how did Bharatnatyam evolve? 